I think we'll get uh, started. Adrian has asked me to introduce Ben. I met Ben, I guess, 1974, when we both had more hair, back in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. And uh, I was impressed with him then. I've been impressed with him since. Ben serves a very useful function, uh, other than what other, ever other functions he serves, such as investigating the origin and formation of planetary systems down at UCLA, where he's a professor of astronomy. Uh, he also provides a reality check for SETI. His sanita somewhat sanitized um, title for this talk is something to the effect of uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, some uh, challenges. And so I challenge uh, Ben to come on up here and lay the word on us. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, as you'll uh, see and hear in just a few minutes. I've been uh, thinking about uh, SETI-related topics for more years than I care to remember, probably 45 years at least. And um, it's uh, nice to be in a place called the SETI Institute where people are concerned about such topics. So this is uh, um, basically what we mean by, by SETI. And um, uh, today I'm going to say a few words about some issues that might present a bit of a challenge for SETI's uh, ultimate success. So I'd like to start by uh, showing a picture of Carl Sagan, who uh, was one of the pioneers in, um, in this whole business. Uh, Carl uh, was a, an assistant professor at uh, Harvard back in the 1960s when I was a graduate student there. And uh, my office was right down the hall from, from Carl's. And uh, uh, late in the afternoon sometimes or on the, on the weekends, uh, um, I would wander on down to Carl's office and we'd chat about various topics. Of course, life in the universe being one of the, the most uh, uh, common of those uh, topics. And uh, Carl definitely encur uh, encouraged my interest in, in possibly searching for uh, signals from other civilizations. Uh, the gentleman uh, here with Carl is, is Bisham Carey, who's uh, at, um, uh, worked with Carl at Cornell when, when Carl was alive. And uh, Bisham has since moved out here to NASA Ames. Uh, where I believe he still has an office, and maybe one over here as well. So uh, Abisham and, uh, and I have been friends uh, for quite a long time also. At any rate, um, my uh, interactions with Carl extended over quite a few years. And um, this is sort of the takeaway message I, I got from from many of our meetings, that um, if, if we ask the question where we humans stand on the scale of cosmic intelligence, Carl felt that um, the progression from the origin of the universe all the way up to life and even intelligent or technological life was uh, so, uh, more or less an inevitability. So we have the, um, the origin of the universe in a big bang, and then we have the formation of stars and uh, galaxies and, 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 and elements and, and planets and whatnot. And then the life originates on many of those planets and evolves through, uh, well, uh, biological evolution, eventually achieving technological intelligence. And the last couple of steps here um, <coughs> are uh, not, not improbable at all. Okay, so this is... Uh, Sort of one way to look at this picture, as you'll see, my, my feelings are somewhat different, but at any rate, that uh, it was uh, Carl's uh, optimistic or enthusiastic view of, of, of things that, that uh, stimulated my interest. That was me back when I was about 30 years old. As, as Seth Shed said, I had more hair then. And this is my friend, Pat Palmer, who was in graduate school at Harvard at the same time. 
and uh, since uh, we gra after we graduated, Pat moved on to a, a professorship at the University of Chicago. At any rate, a few years after um, we were at uh, graduate school at Harvard, being inspired by Carl, we carried out one of the first searches for radio signals from other civilizations. We used this 300-foot telescope. You can see in the background there at the in West Virginia at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and getting our heads out of the way. That's more or less the, the way the telescope looked when we were looking at it for radio signals from a few hundred nearby sun-like stars. And then a few years after we finished our project, that's what the telescope looked like, uh, collapsed in a great heap. And there's a, this picture, these pictures, something very similar appeared in uh, um, in the 1980s, and like the National Enquirer, <laughs> and um, and p when the when the the when the telescope collapsed, Pat and I felt pretty badly because if the National Enquirer was right in their analysis of why the telescope collapsed, we were the ones to blame because the aliens didn't like to be spied on um, <laughs> as we were trying to do. And I love this, uh, this one sentence I took from the Enquirer. I just have to read it to you. I love it so much. We know that extraterrestrials have shot down planes and abducted people, but this is the first time they've been brazen enough to de destroy a government research facility. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and thankfully, nobody got hurt when the, alien, when the aliens took down that radio telescope. Well, this, this project was carried, we carried this project, actually uh, called Ozma 2, named after um, Frank Drake's Ozma 1. We weren't too original in terms of our, uh, uh, what we're calling our search. Um, the, uh, anyway, that was back in the uh, 1970s, and uh, subsequently, a lot more powerful projects have been carried out, and because Talking about them in detail here would be like bringing coals to Newcastle. I'm just going to say a couple of words about Project Phoenix and then even more briefly about the Allen Telescope Array. So this is under the Arecibo Telescope in, in Puerto Rico and a project led by Jill Tarter and Frank Drake and maybe Barney Oliver and a whole bunch of pioneers in this field. And so there's the uh, Arecibo Telescope, one of four a radio telescope, giant radio telescopes that uh, um, the Project Phoenix team used to search, I think about 800 stars uh, over a period of a decade or so, from about the mid 1990s to a few up to a few years ago, middle of this decade. And they used Arecibo and Parks in Australia, I think a, a telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia, and also one in the United Kingdom. And uh, they looked for a total of about 11,000 hours at, uh, again, about 800 stars within a few, light year, a few hundred light years of, of, the, of our solar system. And as, you know, since if, I think if they'd seen, heard something, we would probably have heard about it by now. But at any rate, um, this was uh, the most ambitious search, I believe, for signals from other civilizations, carried out over about a period of a decade. And now, you have the Allen Telescope Array um, in Northern California and uh, with something like 40 relatively small antennas. Hopefully enough money, even these difficult times, will be found to expand it to the 350 telescopes that are its, uh, uh, was the original design. But you know, the economy's not doing well and it's hard to get money, so we'll just have to hope that the Allen Telescope Array, which would be much, much more powerful, than any of the previous uh, search projects will um, will uh, at some at some point get funded and and do the search that that the SETI Institute people want want to do with it. So this is um, a uh, a few words I took from the web page of the SETI Institute, uh, um, and a, a number of people here uh, or and a, a search a number of people who are searching for. Signals from other civilizations uh, were encouraged, I think, uh, over the last 10 years or so by the discovery of so many extrasolar planets, which um, might or might not be uh, a reason for optimism. But anyway, um, this is the, the statement from the, from the web page. But what I'd like to describe today are not the, the searches, but rather some challenges for SETI and for the searches that people are carrying out and might be carrying out in the future. 
Um, I think there are some considerations that are really important to look, to look into um, to decide uh, the best way to carry out some searches and the probability that they'll ultimately be successful. So before I sort of talk with you about um, some specific SETI-related issues, I need to sort of back off for a minute and say some things about, um, about planets. And um, planets come in two main flavors, the gas giants like Jupiter, and then the rocky terrestrial planets like Venus, Earth, and Mars. And uh, you can see from this uh, picture that the atmospheres of, of the Jovian planets and the terrestrial planets are very different. This is dominated basically by hydrogen and helium gas, and there's uh, really no solid surface to stand on. So if you it's hard to build a radio telescope or a rocket ship in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Whereas the terrestrial planets have very different atmospheres, and furthermore, they're different from one another. You can see that worlds without any evident life on them um, are dominated, the Mars and Venus are atmospheres are dominated by carbon dioxide, whereas uh, um, Earth is, its atmosphere has been modified by the presence of life, so we have lots of oxygen and nitrogen. And, and uh, whatnot. And I co so you might distinguish between a living and a non living world by the presence of appropriate molecules in its atmosphere. And the, in order to, um, to make some uh, progress in understanding how prevalent life is out um, there, uh, b whether one's talking about simple life or perhaps technological life, one wants to ultimately, as I'll describe in the next few minutes, take pictures of rocky terrestrial-like worlds and measure the composition of their atmospheres and whatnot. I'll come to that just in a few, few minutes. I just want to sort of spend just a couple of minutes just telling you where things are at right now. The, in terms of actually imaging of extrasolar planets, it's just in the last year or so that this has happened, uh, is happening. And, uh, a, a group of astronomers that I was fortunately part of a year ago reported the presence of three Jovian-like planets in orbit around this young star, bright star 8799. And um, this is really the first images of, a planet, of an extrasolar planetary system. I mean, we knew there were planets out there from various indirect techniques, but in terms of actually taking images, which is what you want to do if you want to measure the composition of a of a, of, a, of a planetary atmosphere. With this thing sit, sitting off by itself, you can point your spectrometer at that planet and determine the atmospheric composition. This just shows you a comparison of the structure of, the, uh, of this system around bright star 8799 with our own solar system to the same scale. So here's, here's the, the asteroid belt is that uh, red circle there, and then these are the four giant planets, and Pluto's out here, and then this is the Kuiper uh, belt of dust and bigger objects out beyond, uh, like Pluto and a few Pluto-like objects and, and whatnot out, out in the red area there. And this is the, uh, uh, to scale again, this system around this extrasolar planetary system. There's like an asteroid belt analog, then these three giant planets, and then more uh, dust and, 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 and uh, objects out beyond the three giant planets. So this is very, except for the fact this is only about 60 million years old and we're four and a half billion years old, this system looks quite analogous to our own planetary system. So these are the kind of discoveries that hopefully will be made in the, uh, in the coming years uh, as, uh, as instrumentation improves. But those are gas giant planets, and again, we're not going to find technology um, and perhaps not even simple life on gas giant planets. If we want to find life as we know it, we really have to be looking at um, uh, rocky planets, uh, planets more like you know, the Earth or, or Mars or something, something of that order. And, um, and we need, in order to have a, a, a prayer of, of finding life as we know it, there may be other exotic forms of life, but life as we know it, we need water. Um, and, uh, um, but if you want to do SETI, if you want to you know, discover radio signals coming from another civilization, you, you, the planet can't be entirely covered by ice nor entirely covered with liquid water. So it's you know, a fairly specific set of 
circumstances required. And what evidence do we have for the existence of terrestrial or rocky planets orbiting around other stars? This is really we're in the, the very earliest moments of research of finding uh, evidence for rocky planets orbiting around other stars. And there are no direct images of any rocky planets orbiting around other stars. There are some indirect, a bit of indirect evidence. This is a system um, BD plus 2307, an artist's conception of this system. It's, 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 it's got a huge amount of dust. There's dust associated with the asteroid belt and out beyond Neptune and our own planetary system. But this particular star system, which actually is two sun-like stars orbiting in just a few day period around one another, has got a huge amount of dust, like a million times more dust orbiting around it than is orbiting around our sun. And the question is, where did this dust come from? And um, it looks like this is a system which is maybe a couple of billion years old, maybe not quite as old as our own planetary system, but still quite old, possibly even enough time to develop continents and oceans if there is a, you know, an Earth-like planet orbiting around the star. But where did all the dust come from? Well, the only really uh, plausible explanation is that sometime in the not too distant past, cosmically speaking, two terrestrial planets collided with one another, two rocky planets, creating this huge amount of debris which then went into orbit around the central stars and uh, is what we're seeing now in the, with our infrared telescope. So this is the presence of so much dust around such an old star is indirect evidence of the existence of uh, rocky planets. And there are a few examples like this that we know of now, not too many, but a few. Um, in terms of the dust, there's a uh, European satellite, Herschel, that's been um, launched earlier, it was launched earlier this year. But in terms of uh, pl Earth-like planets, um, the uh, Kepler mission, which was also launched earlier this year, is, uh, is uh, I, I think, an excellent first step in really determining how common Earths or super-Earths are as they trans... The, the idea with Kepler is that just as Venus or Mercury sometimes tra um, transits or moves between the Sun and the, and the Earth, and we can see the little s dark spot of Venus as it moves across the, the, the Sun's disk. So if you're looking at um, an extrasolar planetary system, if things are lined up just right, as they sometimes will be, you can see uh, uh, planets orbiting in front of the star, uh, moving in front of the stars about which they orbit, by diminishing the light from that star by just a little bit, but because Kepler is uh, out there in interstellar, interplanetary space, well, off the Earth anyway, um, above the Earth's atmosphere, you can measure very, very um, precisely the, uh, the diminution of light from a star as a, as a, um, as something, a super-Earth, something perhaps somewhat bigger than Earth passes in front of that star. So anyway, in the next couple of years, we should be hearing about how prevalent these Earths are. But they won't, how prevalent Earth-like objects might be, but they're not actually imaging these worlds that they, the Kepler uh, may or may not be discovering. Um, they're, they're just seeing indirectly the presence of that world as it moves in front of the star about which it orbits. What we really want to do ultimately in this game is to um, detect um, by imaging uh, Earth-like worlds and then measure the composition of their atmospheres and possibly uh, be, uh, determine whether there are continents and oceans and all those good things on the world. So I want to just say a few words about, about how that might progress over the coming decades. The problem is if you want to see an Earth orbiting around another star, it's incredibly much fainter than that, the star about which orbits 10 billion times fainter. So the Earth here at visible wavelengths is 10 billion times fainter than the Sun. And even out at a wavelength of 10 microns, where you and I and the Earth are emitting most of our heat energy, the Earth is still a million times fainter than the, than the Sun. So this is a huge, and it's very close. When observed, if you move away of, you know, tens of light years and you look back, this at our soul, at, our, at Earth orbiting around the Sun, the Earth would be really, really close to the Sun. It'd be like 
you know, a, a opening of a new shopping center with these big searchlights going up and bouncing off the clouds or something like that. And he put a little candle or something right next to that ferociously bright searchlight. Um, that's the kind of problem that we face. And um, so this is not an easy, um, easy uh, experiment to carry out, actually detecting an Earth-like world orbiting around another star. But, um, and imaging that Earth-like world. But there, are, there, are, there have been designs suggested both here in the United States and in Europe and um, for actually finding and imaging and measuring the atmospheric content of these Earth-like worlds. In the, U in the U.S., the project, the NASA project, is dubbed Terrestrial Planet Finder. In Europe, the analogous project was called Darwin. And the point of this, this slide is to which I think is important when one's thinking about this in terms of SETI, which I'll come to not too much further down the road here, is in, in, when, you're, uh, when you're thinking about SETI, we live in a unique moment of history right now. We live in a, a time when we have SETI, where people have been carrying out, since uh, Frank Drake carried out Project Osma 1, some, what, 50 or so years ago, maybe by now, um, the... Uh, um, we, we, have, uh, we have people doing SETI, searching for radio signals, but we don't yet have terrestrial planet finder. We don't yet have satellites up there that can actually discover and image and measure the atmosphere composition of Earth-like worlds orbiting around other stars. Now, TPF has been put on maybe indefinite hold because of NASA's budget issues. Uh, and because you know our economy is struggling and all that, so it's hard to know when TPF will actually be built. I fear it won't actually be be constructed and be observing in my lifetime. But let's say it's you know within the next 50 years, we have uh, telescopes out in space, and I'll show you a couple of designs in just a second that are able to image Earth-like worlds orbiting around other stars. That would mean there's about a century or so of time between the origins of SETI, the first observations or searches for radio signals and the time we have terrestrial planet finders. So in that sense, we live in a unique moment of history because f more than 50 years ago there was neither SETI nor terrestrial planet finder and maybe in 50 years from now we'll have both. And I think it's because we live in this time when we have one but not the other that the proponents of SETI searches have not taken into account the implications of terrestrial planet finders sufficiently in designing their searches or in dis deducing how successful they might be. So I'll come to all that in the coming sort of discussion. It, so this is the um, atmospheric infrared sounder spectrum looking, the satellite looking down at the Earth's atmosphere. And again, this is the infrared wavelengths with which the Earth and you and I emit most of our energy. You can see some molecules that basically are due to the presence of life on Earth, ozone and methane. Um, and here's another spectrum showing the same kind of picture. So this is, this is the region where you're getting the thermal emission from the Earth's atmosphere. And this is reflected sunlight here. But you can see these molecules that we care about for life, water, methane, ozone, which comes from oxygen and, and whatnot. And and this is a very unusual non-equilibrium atmosphere. There's just way more methane in the Earth's uh, a, a oxygen, oxygenating atmosphere than there should be if, this was, if life wasn't around. There's like a huge amount of methane coming from bovine flatulence and you know, the 1.3 billion cows or whatever it is are producing huge amounts of methane. So, so the unusual aspects or nature of the Earth's atmosphere is very much dependent on life here. And, and so you can think of sort of living worlds like the Earth and, and dead worlds like Mars and Venus, and you want to you know, look for these biosignatures. So here's just a comparison of the spectrum of the Earth, showing again ozone and water vapor and methane and, um, compared to Venus and Mars, which pretty much just show carbon, the presence of carbon dioxide and, and not much else. So how does one go about finding these Earth-like worlds orbiting around other stars. Uh, d I mean, finding in the sense of actually being able to measure their atmospheric constituents and ultimately image these Earth-like worlds. Well, there have been a number of different design concepts. Um, one is a single large telescope in space 
with a, ba a corona graph, basically a spot in the center of the focal plane which blocks out the light from the central s from the star that you're looking at and and but allows light in the surround the region surrounding the star to pass through to your your detector and hopefully there'll be a planet there a terrestrial planet that you you'll discover um, so that's one possible way you block the light from the central star by just putting a spot to block block that portion of, of your detector array another possibility is so this would be basically a, a, a an optical design. Another possibility is in the infrared, longer wavelengths, to have a, a number of different telescopes operating in tandem in something called an interferometer. And when you have an interferometer, you can have constructive and destructive interference between the uh, signals, or among the signals detected by the telescopes. In this case, four, four different telescopes are envisioned. And if you have destructive interference right where the star that you're looking at is, you can basically get rid of, um, subtract away, negate the starlight, and, and again, around that, that central interference region, um, you would have um, cons constructive interference, and, the, uh, and so that the, if there was a planet surrounding the star, you could see the planet and the light, the, the light would be nulled out, basically, as, as best you can. Now obviously, these are not simple things to do, but there are people designing various, um, various uh, aspects and components of these systems, and, and, um, and are quite, they're quite optimistic that they ought to work if the money was forthcoming. This is yet a third design. This is one where you have this spot that blocks the starlight, not in the guts of the telescope, but out here in uh, space, in uh, interplanetary space, um, in front of the telescope. In this case, this might be uh, tens of thousands of miles separating the telescope from the occulter. And this is a simpler design, because you don't have to have you know, complex op optics inside the telescope. But the problem is, you know, now we're pointing at this star. If we want to point at a star over here, you've got to take this uh, you can, it's easy to rotate to, to you know rotate to swing the telescope around. Now you got to bring this thing over, you know, 100,000 miles or something like that. So each each uh, design has its its advantages and disadvantages. Anyway, um, so these are some first generation instruments that have been suggested um, for uh, for first measuring the atmospheric composition of a world and then actually taking pictures of it if it looks like it's maybe a living world with, with the kinds of molecules uh, in its atmosphere that are characteristic of, of the Earth. So you can see that if you, um, if you observe a, um, a, an Earth-like world for years, you might see seasonal variations that we have here on the Earth, but if you um, have a long life civilization and you're, you're paying attention to what's going on for um, maybe tens of thousands of years, you can see things like ice ages coming and going and, and various changes and, and whatnot. So these are, all the, these are the kind of things that could be done after you have your first detection of an Earth-like world and measure the composition of its atmosphere. So you say, ah, we've got a living world, now let's see in more detail, whether it's got oceans and continents and things like that. So let me now turn to what the implications of this might be for SETI. Suppose that the um, terrestrial planet finder discovers a living world out there. And, um, what would happen next? Well, surely anybody who's got a SETI antenna is going to point that antenna at that star with the living world orbiting around it and see if they can detect any signals from a technological civilization. In fact, I dare say that if Kepler finds some worlds in its field that, are, um, that look like they have Earths or super-Earths orbiting around them, that people who are carrying out SETI experiments are very likely to point their telescope at those worlds. Anytime we find a world, whether in the case of Kepler, we won't know whether it's a living world or, or a non-living world, but um, at any rate, when we find a living world especially, um, we're going to be pointing our radio telescopes at it to see if we can find any signals. 
from a technological civilization. And suppose you're not successful. Suppose that you don't get a response um, for a decade, a century, a thousand years. It really depends on how much money the funding agencies are willing to toss your way and also how much stick to itness you have, um, how, um, how long you want to you keep, uh, keep looking without necessarily giving, getting a signal. So if there is, now remember, we've discovered a living world orbiting around a nearby star. As you're all aware, they've had life on Earth for a lot longer than we've had radio telescopes. So the chances are, if somebody had pointed a, teles a, a, a radio telescope at our living world, that they would not have gotten a signal. You know, it might have been 10 million years ago, long before we arose. So if there, if, if, um, if there's this living world and we look with a radio telescope for signals from SETI and we s don't see anything, well, there are two possibilities. One can just, you know, either keep looking or just give it up after a thousand years of non-success or something like that. I, we could do nothing, but this do nothing would have to be for a very or long time indeed because the stars near the sun, the, they're currently near the sun, have been near the sun for a million, millions of years and will continue to be near the sun, sort of our local neighbors, for another million or millions of years because the stars in the solar vicinity are moving relatively slowly relative to one another. So it takes a long time for these two ships to pass in the night, this, this, this system with the living world and our own solar system. So one possibility is just let this living world pass on by and do nothing. Again, we're assuming that there's no SETI signal uh, coming from, no, no intelligent radio signal coming from. The other possibility is that we might want to go and actually investigate this living world. Um, we might want to uh, build and construct a, uh, a spaceship. And I believe personally that the latter is by far the more likely possibility based on what we know about human nature and intelligent creatures and whatnot. About 400 years ago when Galileo and others first started to look out at the, um, at the uh, objects in our, in our solar system with uh, the newly invented telescope, they found out a lot of interesting things. But there's just a limit to what you can do when you look at something from afar. Um, and so as soon as we were able to build spaceships, rocket ships, a few decades ago, in the, last, in the last century, to go out and investigate the Vikings, the pioneers, the voyagers, these other worlds in our, in our planetary system, we, we did that. Um, because ultimately, if you want to know a lot about what's going on somewhere, you've got to go there. You've got to actually physically go there. Um, and there are many people uh, who uh, really care about biology, and uh, I'm not just talking about technological life. I'm talking about you know simple life and whatnot. Uh, here's a quote I took from uh, Penelope Boston appeared uh, maybe a decade or so ago on Destination Mars. I, have a burn I am a biologist. I have a burning need to know about life in the universe. So if, um, if there was a discovery of this living world orbiting around a nearby star, I can be pretty certain that people like Penelope Boston, after giving the SETI teams their chance to, dis to, to find te uh, radio signals from a technological civilization and having no such signals found would would definitely be in favor of going to uh, to this living world because because most life doesn't do radio telescopes and um, and if you want to know about how life is is formed what's it formed out of whether it's uh, carbon based whether it's, it's made out of you know, nucleic acids and proteins and you know just how similar or dissimilar it is to our own life, you basically have to go to the world, the living world that you've discovered with your terrestrial planet finder. And uh, <coughs> NASA understands um, that uh, interstellar exploration is, with rockets, um, 
would be something of, of interest to people. E even a decade or so ago, this was only a few decades after the Russians launched the first, first Sputnik, NASA was already holding a, a workshop on robotic interstellar exploration in the, in the current century. This was a workshop I was one of the engineers and scientists who attended at Caltech, um, sponsored by JPL. And we met for a couple of days to talk about the various problems and potentialities of sending rocket ships outside of our own solar system. And at the end of the conference, um, or this workshop, two-day workshop, we all got together in a big powwow to, to talk about how might we actually be able to get civilization to, to fund this mission, which was, would not be inexpensive. And, um, and by effectively unanimous agreement of everybody in the ro room, what, the, the, what we needed to do is to show people that there was a living world orbiting around some other star, and that would be the best um, chance, the most uh, plausible way to get human beings to basically fund uh, a voyage to, uh, to another star, another planetary system with a living world there. So, so this is um, something that, uh, that I think a lot of people um, are, care about, um, that is a simple life, and uh, if, and this is a, a quote I sort of took from uh, Freeman Dyson, one of the leading physicists of the second half of the last century. It's basically a question of motivation, not of, not of physics, in order to get to these other star systems. I mean, what's the motivation for going to a planet orbiting around another star? And again, finding a living world would certainly be a, a one strong, strong bit of motivation for not only biologists like Hill Hillary Boston, but also for the, the man and woman in the street. And, and I think that a lot of people actually like to go on such voyages. This is just one um, quote uh, that I take, and there are others, uh, um, the, uh, um, but uh, the, this is uh, from Peter Hillary, a, a, a New Zealander, and basically, he is like many adventurers. They want to. They don't want to watch something on going on on TV. That's not satisfying. They want to go out there and experience um, things for themselves. And so, people like this would be um, not only interested in bio the biology, but also ready to go out there and start on interstellar voyages. So let me say a few words about interstellar rocket ships. Um, Here's a, a couple of pictures I took a few decades ago when I was driving to that telescope in West Virginia. Well, anyway, I guess I don't know whether anybody in this room believes in the extraterrestrials coming here, but most people think that we're going to have to um, go out there with our own rocket ships rather than having them make it easy and come here. So. Um, how might that be accomplished? Well, the first step might be to build something like the space station, which has sort of already more or less been done, and then um, using the space station as sort of a blasting off point, um, start sending rockets out. Now, this is a, your standard chemical rocket, uh, full of, as Shakespeare said, full of sound and fury and signifying nothing in terms of interstellar travel, because even though this looks, you know, lots of noise and and, ex and light and all kinds of things like that. In fact, these chemical rockets move very slowly. So here's an artist's conception of the one of the pioneer spacecraft out in the outer regions of the solar system. There are now four U.S. spacecraft, two pioneers and two voyagers that are leaving our s planetary system and going out into interstellar space. But because they were launched with chemical rockets, they're not moving very quickly. So. Um, and they're not pointed at any nearby stars either. But even if they were pointed at some nearby star, it would take like tens of thousands of years for them to get there. So you need some more powerful propulsion mechanism than chemical uh, energy. And so there are a number of suggestions that have been put forward over the course of the last 50 years or so. One is uh, nuclear power, especially nuclear fusion. So here's a picture of a hydrogen bomb explosion. And there was a rocket ship that uh, called the Project Orion that was um, designed sort of, you know, um, 
it, uh, studied and analyzed by a team led by Freeman Dyson, whose quote I was showed you a few, few slides ago. Anyway, the idea with, with Project Orion was you build some kind of space colony which might hold hundreds or thousands of people or embryos or zygotes or whatnot, and, um, and then you attach to the back of that space colony some giant pusher plate. You carry millions of hydrogen bombs with you. You toss the hydrogen bombs out behind the spacecraft, and when the hydrogen bomb blows up, the debris is going at something like a percent or two, a couple of percent of the speed of light. And some of that debris can hit the pusher plate that you've got behind your space colony and accelerate your rocket ship up to, say, a percent or two of the speed of light, with, or your space colony up to this percent or two of the speed of light. So you could get to a nearby, some of the nearest stars in, say, a hundred or a couple of hundred years. Now, carrying a millions of hydrogen bombs and blowing them up isn't the most elegant way to proceed, possibly. So let me just mention a couple of other suggestions as to how you might accelerate up to a percent or two of the speed of light, which is sort of what you need if you want to get to another star within a century or two, which is, you know, not not exactly a short voyage, but not unreasonably long either. So another possibility is what's called an electromagnetic mass driver. You have um, basically accelerate pellets of material um, electromagnetically in a string of these kind of accelerators that, that extend like a few hundred thousand miles, like the distance between the Earth and the, the, the Moon, but not one continuous few hundred thousand miles. You'd have, you know, one segment and then you'd have a space, another segment. Just as long as you have a rifle barrel that's a few hundred mi thousand miles long, you can then direct your pellet stream precisely enough to hit the back of one of these pusher plates. Um, and so you have the, the uh, material, the energy for the, the t to propel the rocket is actually produced back in our own solar systems. You don't have to carry all this stuff on board the rocket with you. And you um, basically direct it very precisely at this giant pusher plate and can accelerate this kind of pellet stream um, rocket up to a percent or two of the speed of light. Um, now that's, that's using material particles. You could also use light. The light from the, the, the lights above you are pushing you gently into your seats. Um, but with a very powerful be beacon of light, like you know, a powerful laser or something, you can um, actually produce quite a strong pressure, and so you can give momentum to the, this, basically this interstellar rocket by um, directing a lot of light energy. And this, this early design was for a thousand mile diameter lens in the outer region of our solar system, fed by sunlight or energy produced possibly by other, in other ways, but now you might imagine that building a thousand mile <coughs> diameter lens is probably not so simple to do. So a more current version of this technique would be to have lots of individual, uh, much smaller, many, many smaller lenses operating in phase together to produce, again, a powerful um, beam of radiation to accelerate your, your rocket ship. Now, of course, once you're going at one or two percent of the speed of light and you get to your target, you don't want to be zooming by at one percent the speed of light. You've got to figure out a way to slow down. So, um, so you come to rest at your, at your target star, your target planet. So this is another one way to possibly do that in the, la in the laser light propulsion scheme. You detach the payload and then you can decelerate the payload this way. So. Anyway, um, why would one want to make a voyage like this? Well, I can't tell you what life's going to be like out there. Obviously, we don't even know if it exists, and we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. But I can sort of describe a voyage to you that probably everybody in this room would be, would be happy to take, and that if we could. If we could get into a time machine rather than a space machine, a spaceship, get into something which went back in time, back to the earliest stages of life on Earth, um, I think we'd all would be just delighted to maybe go back um, a billion years and then step forward and sort of you know, take time s s shots every 20, 30 million years or so going um, forward in time. So you might start out 
in the day, the Precambrian days when we just had stromatolites before we had my macroscopic organisms, um, before we had macroscopic life, but all life was fundamentally microscopic. And uh, then the earliest Cambrian times with the trilobites uh, were the dominant or a dominant form of life on Earth for a very long time. And then moving forward through the other eras of Cam the Cambrian time, ultimately to the uh, wondrous age of the dinosaurs to see how they were around for 100 million years. Oops, wrong way. So, um, so I think we would all, we'd all be delighted to go on such a voyage if we had the opportunity. And I think for that reason, similar reasons, many people um, would be delighted to go on a voyage to, uh, find, to, dis to investigate a living world. Okay, so I've been looking at things from the perspective of, of human beings. So now what I want to do is turn this um, perspective around and um, ask uh, how a technological uh, civilization uh, might, might respond um, if they came, say, within a hundred, few hundred light years of the Earth and discovered with their terrestrial planet finder our, our amazing planet. So here's a picture of the Earth. The, the extraterrestrials are probably not going to get such a, a detailed view as that, but they easily, easily, within a couple of generations of terrestrial planet finder, could get a picture that looks like this, where you can sort of distinguish the oceans from the, um, from the continents, and you can distinguish deserts from areas where they're, like uh, you know, the Amazon, where hopefully they'll still be um, living creatures uh, and they're not, not in, into the distant future, but with, because, uh, because each of these areas has its own spectral signature and, and um, chlorophyll and life have their very, um, very characteristic spectral signatures. So by, by basically looking at the, at the Earth in this way and by doing spectroscopy at the same time as the various pieces, the oceans and the continents and whatnot pass in view, um, one could learn a huge amount. So what, what if, what if um, a, uh, an extraterrestrial civilization on a, on a planet that uh, came within a hundred or few hundred light years of the Earth, say a million years ago, and they say they, they, they pointed their radio telescopes at, um, at the Earth, presumably they were, well, maybe they're doing SETI, and um, and so this is a million years ago, though, because all the star systems within a few hundred light years of the, of the Earth have been our nearest neighbors for quite a while now. So um, any uh, extraterrestrial civilization with a terrestrial planet finder would have found Earth a long time ago, but because we were still, say, a million years in the future, their steady experiment would fail. So then the question is, are they as curious as we are? Um, and I expect that somebody who's doing SETI has got to be curious, so I would say they probably are curious, and can they build spaceships? And um, when you're as, you know, a million-year-old civilization, I think building spaceships should not be a great, uh, a, a particularly difficult thing to do. So I think that if you sort of look at um, what I've been saying from the standpoint of, uh, of either our own civilization or a, a putative extraterrestrial civilization that might be doing SETI, um, I think these three sort of simple postulates are, uh, need to be seriously considered. That, that at the same time we have SETI, we'll have terrestrial planet finder, that intelligent life is curious not only about technological life but also about simple life forms, and then um, having discovered a living world that the Biologists and others of, 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 of the world, of the Penelope Bostons and people like that, they're not going to be satisfied to just let that living world drift by, but they'll want to construct spaceships and visit um, that world. So I think that sort of the bottom line, if you believe those three simple postulates, is that, um, that there's virtually no chance that, that SETI searches of nearby star systems can be successful. Because anybody who's doing SETI from those star systems has known about our living world for a million years or so, and they're not here. 
What about expanding this? So this is just talking about the local vicinity and um, you know, lo relatively local SETI searches of the kind that pro were done with Project Phoenix. So let's, let's sort of try and look uh, more long ago and far away. Um, this is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, which is somewhat similar to our own. And on this kind of a scale, the, the solar system might be out here somewhere. Um, <coughs> and so uh, what's, what's the prospect of finding technological life, if not in our own vicinity, elsewhere in, the, uh, um, in, in our galaxy? Okay, so I've been talking really about only the last million years or so, the most, the most local star systems to our own planetary system. But actually, the Earth's had this oxygenic atmosphere for going back two billion years. So that if um, any ter extraterrestrial that had the equivalent of terrestrial planet finder that passed in our, in our vicinity in the past two billion years or so would have recognized the Earth as an unusual place and likely as a living world. And during this two billion years, millions of sun-like stars have passed near our solar system. And yet no one has come here in all that time. And um, so this, this uh, again, the, the one, one needs to th think about these things in terms of long time, long life civilization so that, um, you know, building the kind of rocket ships or maybe some other design that, that you know, nobody's thought of yet. Uh, to, um, to visit living worlds should just not be a problem for a civilization that has been around for a long time. Um, so the, 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 with this two billion years of history, basically um, there are lots and lots of civilizations that, uh, lots and lots of stars that have passed by our, our planetary system. And if, if, if extraterrestrial civilizations were, were common, then surely one of these civilizations would have decided to come here long ago. And yet there's no evidence that anybody has ever come here. So I think that, the, um, that if one is, wants to do SETI, that one wants to look um, for distant civilizations, ones that are not sort of at more or less the same distance as the, uh, uh, from the galactic center as our as our sun is, but are you know, either further out or much closer in, um, star systems that have never been near our own system. And the problem when you're doing, you're looking at distance civilizations or distant stars for, for signals from a civilization is that they're not, because they're so far away and they have no idea that we're here, they're not going to be generating signals that are meant for our, per our benefit here on Earth. There'll have to be a much more general kind of a, 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 a motivation for them to, to, to generate signals that we might be able to detect even at great distances. And also, if we finally do detect something, it's going to be, f if it's far away, the round if you want to actually have a dialogue, the round trip communication time will be very slow. But I do think that uh, the fact that no one's come here means that the ci these civilizations must be uncommon, technological civilizations, and that, that if one is detected, it's going to be quite a large distance from, from the Earth. So anyway, this is the question I leave you with, and, um, and the thought that, um, that there's a good chance that these will be the ones carrying out these uh, interstellar voyages. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, I'm going to start off the questions. Uh, could it be that uh, the fact that we know uh, how to do terrestrial planet finder and um, in theory should be able to get it done, uh, as you say, uh, perhaps uh, the reason why nobody has visited a terrestrial planet like ours um, is because they are so common. Perhaps they didn't find us of interest because they found terrestrial planets mm -hmm. just like this. Okay, so, so did, did everybody hear the question? No. Okay, the que I think the question is maybe um, the reason they haven't come to, to investigate Earth life is because simple life is so common um, in the galaxy that, you know, after you've investigated, you know, a hundred or thousand or whatever's um, uh, simple life forms, 
you're, you just sort of lose interest or something. And so, you know, what's the big deal about coming here? Well, I, I think there are two reasons why I don't think that's plausible. One, I think, although just my personal gut feeling, is that when Terrestrial Planet Finder actually is up there, they're going to find no living worlds, but they're not going to be a dime a dozen. But that's something that can be, uh, uh, you know, that's right now we don't know for sure and something that could be determined experimentally, ultimately, by these, these kind of space telescopes. I think that we'll find that, that living worlds are, are few and far between. But the other, the other um, reason why I don't think it's likely that they'll just sort of blow us off because, we're s because life is so common is because um, even though uh, Mount Everest has been climbed a lot of times, or a lot of people have taken a trip on a raft down the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. That still doesn't stop many, many other people from wanting to climb Mount Everest or take that raft trip. And I just would find it really hard to believe that, frankly, that there wouldn't be somebody among all these creatures out there that wouldn't want to come and investigate this specific place, even if you know they knew of a hundred other places or something like that. Obviously, nobody knows for sure. If we knew for sure, we wouldn't be having these kind of discussions. Um, but anyway, those are two reasons why I think that, um, well, A, that it's going to turn out that even simple life is not common, um, or simple life is uncommon, maybe I should say, and that, um, and that even if it was common, they'd still want to come here. That's my personal opinion. So your argument is that um, the, solar, the Earth would have been um, explored millions of years ago by some extraterrestrial civilization, but why would they have stuck here? I mean, they would have they would have cataloged all the th life and gone home and come back a few million years later to check and see if we're still here. Well, um, so why why would they bother to hang around? Well, it's like the, the way I look at it is like the Polynesians who um, first found Hawaii after a long and dangerous voyage across the Pacific Ocean. They didn't. You know, they didn't s get out in Hawaii or something, take out their Nikons and take a few pictures and then go back to Tahiti or wherever they may have come from. They stayed. After you take one of these interstellar voyages, which take, you know, hundreds of years, you're not just going to pack up and leave. I mean, the, the kind of creatures that are likely to want to do such a voyage are not only those who are curious, but maybe also those who are like hermits or want to be in a place where they're not, you know, not every, you know, not everybody else is around, or something like that. Maybe, you know, we have, I could imagine that in our own planetary system, if there are, um, you know, it ultimately maybe a trillion people or something living, not not on the surface of the Earth, but in space colonies or something. You could imagine a few, a small percentage of those creatures, whatever we look like in the future, our machines look like in the future, might want to go off and and be in a place which is pretty much untouched or something. And, yeah. Hi, you're making an assumption that uh, high levels of technology persist for geological periods of time, and yet the evidence is certainly out as whether our own civilization will be capable of this level of technology for thousands of years. Suppose most civilizations collapse back to a, a technical level where they're capable of sending radio signals but not building starships. Wouldn't that change your logic to some extent? Well, um, <coughs> the, uh, if, if they could uh, on, only uh, do SETI and not build starships, then um, I mean, if that again, that's a rather unusual sort of slice of the possible phase spaces, which is sort of what I was trying. Um, the you um, you'd ha you'd have to imagine basically that that all civilizations, or most civiliz almost all civilizations, basically end up in this very strange niche, where they're able and willing to do SETI and not um, able to to build a starship, and um, it, you know, you just got to assume that that happens over and over again. It seems to me very unlikely that that would happen in a even one situation, much less um, in in every in every case, which is, I guess, I guess where you're going. Um, again, with with so many different um, s 
s s uh, um, sun-like stars passing by the Earth in the last billions of years, a lot of, two billion years, a lot of cr extraterrestrial creatures, if they're common, presumably would have had a chance to, 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 to come here. And um, you've got to think of reasons like the one you just suggested that would essentially rule them all out. And it just seems to me that's not so easy, n not so plausible. Um, what about budget limitations? I mean, there's an awful lot of things we would like to do, but can't find the budget money to do, and maybe never will find the budget money to do. Well, civilization right now is going, in my opinion, in an unsustainable direction. And it's because of that that we can't even afford terrestrial planet finder, much less sending uh, rocket ships with a thousand people on them to another star system. So um, either where things are going to turn around and um, we will become sustainable or we'll sort of do ourselves in. I mean, one of the things about having a short lifetime for a, um, for a technological civilization is that I think all the, uh, the people who were involved with SETI and on whatever opinions they may have, I think we all agree that for there to be a, lo a, a lot of technological civilizations in the galaxy, the, av the lifetime of an average civilization must be quite long, you know, maybe millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years. So that um, if SETI is going to succeed, the average to typical civilization can't wipe itself out um, in, a, in a very short time scale. Because if it only lives a few hundred or a thousand years of technological civilization, then there just can't be very many in the galaxy. Um, in terms of um, the expenses of these kinds of missions, we spend right now, we being human beings, about a trillion dollars a year on the worldwide arms race. And um, the person, or a person, who uh, developed this pellet stream idea, or pellet stream propulsion, as uh, one of the contributions to extraterrestrials, Where Are They?, a book that I co-edited a decade or so ago, Cliff Singer, um, plasma physicist, estimated that the cost of, um, of the building the pellet stream um, rocket would be a, a million person centuries, that is, a million people working for a century. And that comes out to be about $10 trillion, if you, you know, work out in dollars, which is just about one decade of the worldwide arms race. So I don't see that finances are a problem. If we can spend um, Ten trillion dollars on blowing our s each other's uh, up or building, you know, all kinds of militaristic things in a decade. We can spend this, that kind of money on these kind of interstellar voyages. Furthermore, the you know, assuming we've become sustainable, we are going to have so much more energy and resources at our disposal by leaving the Earth and um, and and taking advantage of lots of other objects in our solar system and a lot of sun, solar energy that doesn't impinge on the Earth, that what seems expensive to us now will be um, very, very inexpensive indeed to uh, our descendants a thousand years from now. Ben, uh, first of all, thank you for a great talk. Uh, very enjoyable. I've had the privilege of hearing you talk on this subject a couple of times over the years. This is Carl Pilcher. Uh, and I continue to think that your logic is fundamentally flawed. <laughs> <coughs> and one way of expressing the alternative perspective is to focus on some of the language that you use, human nature, intelligent creatures, and motivation. This is, this is the language of individualism. Now, the one collective word that you use a lot is civilization, but your, your basic argument is that it is the action of individuals that is driving developments in civilization. And this sounds a lot like the great actor theory of historical developments, which says that it is major individuals in the past that have caused uh, you know, major historical developments to occur. And that is a theory that I think has been rejected by, by much of the mainstream historian community in favor of a more, much more complex model involving all the interrelated forces 
uh, basically a cultural perspective on history. So rather than human nature, I would think human culture would be a more productive perspective to bring to this question. And when you look at things from a standpoint of human culture, I think you can readily conclude that many, many things that could happen don't happen. And if you, just for example, all the futuristic predictions in the 1950s about what 1980s and 2000s were going to be like were frequently wildly off the mark. Things that could happen didn't happen, and of course things that weren't anticipated did happen. So I would just say that there is a very, very different perspective that one can bring to these questions that would lead one, I think, to conclusions very different from yours. And I say that with all due respect. Um, I guess I said, if there was, we knew the answer, we wouldn't be having this discussion. I, I guess the, the only thing I would say in response to that, Carl, is that, um, that the kind of future I envision for um, any long life civilization, whether it be our own or some other one, is where we, th that, that civilization is living in a sustainable fashion and all, pretty much all the trials and tribulations that we are currently facing now don't exist anymore. They've been dealt with in an appropriate, rational way. There are lots and lots of people, or whatever we morph into, um, and um, out there, and they're, um, and they are, uh, they have, they have different interests. It's not all just one. Like, I don't know. There, maybe there's. Even I guess even every 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 uh, group of uh, creatures I guess has their different uh, social creatures has different niches and, and the, um, different creatures doing different things or playing different roles. I, I expect that there will be so many um, descendants. Um, we'll have so many descendants that the, that a relatively small percentage of them will be able to basically decide they want to do this and they want to do that and that it just won't be this one monolithic uh, culture that extends over, uh, over, you know, 500 billion people or whatever, or 500 billion descendants, whatever we, whatever we turn out to be. And that, um, that there will be people um, like uh, Peter Hillary or Penelope Boston um, who will, will, will just not necessarily be the same as you know the, the dominant culture and and you know there's no way to, to know this is the, what we're talking about here is so far and I mean frankly I think the the biggest uncertainty in all of this is what will um, a, a civilization that's you know hundreds of thousands or millions of years or tens of millions of years old be doing or want to be doing it's just you know, given how fast science and technology has advanced in the last few hundred years, it's just sort of mind, you know, mind-boggling to even try and think about such things. So, anyway. Uh, ben, uh, it's always going to be cheaper to build even a galactic-scale beacon than it is to build a starship. By my own estimates, the difference is two to three orders of magnitude for comparing a galactic-scale beacon, which is quite visible, to a starship which can reach over ranges of hundreds of light years. Therefore, we would be well advised to look for the beacons rather than to look for evidence of visits by ex extraterrestrials. Well, we can look for both. One doesn't exclude the other. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. as I say, I, I, would, I hope that uh, the SETI Institute can get the funds necessary to um, bring the, out the Allen Telescope Array to completion and we can look for evidence in our own solar system we've been visited, which I can, I'm sure we're not going to find. Um, and, uh, um, and we can be doing these radio search uh, projects. I think, again, if you think about this in terms of cost, you're missing one of the points, the main points I'm trying to make, and that is that, um, that a civilization that's gone beyond, well beyond where we are right now, Cost at the kind of the kind of level that we're worrying about now is just not going to be relevant anymore. They're going to have so much more energy and materials at their disposal. An advanced civilization would be our own or some other one that we're just we're just not thinking um, you know far enough basically in the future to uh, to be worrying about such things. Furthermore, the kind of person who's 
uh, is thinking, oh, I'd rather save some money by building a galactic beacon rather than getting in a starship um, and going off, even if it costs some more money, to discover a living world, is not necessarily the kind of person who wants to take a trip down the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon or climb K2 or something like that. I mean, there's, there's, there's a variety of, of ways of thinking about things, and, um, and I think that you don't need everybody to want to get on that spaceship in order for it to happen. So to follow up Jim's question, um, you said if we detect a living world, um, we have two, and there is no um, artificial signal, a signal that we could pick up at the SETI search, um, we have two options essentially, do nothing or build a spaceship. Would an intermediate position be while we're building a spaceship to construct a beacon, uh, quicker, cheaper to do that, or would you want to hold off on and just uh, go for the direct contact? Well, um, I'm not sure what constructing a beacon would necessarily happen because there you're trying to let somebody else know. R you, but you, you right. So what I'm saying is, if if we do an extensive uh, passive SETI search and don't find anything, is a reasonable alternative to say, you know, maybe no one is uh, transmitting, maybe everyone's waiting uh, for someone else to transmit. Is that a reasonable next step for our civilization, or should we hold off for the ability to actually travel to other stars? Well, the, um, I don't think baby civilizations like our own should have the burden of the ability of transmitting. It's, um, <coughs> I think if after, you know, I don't know, a thousand years, some trivial time, cosmically speaking, we'll be able to have solar power collectors orbiting around the sun to, to, per, to gather energy at a much greater rate than we can currently um, do and um, and so you know a civilization like that is the one that should be um, most interested in and concerned about broadcasting you know powerful beacons out into space. I don't think that that's where we should what our role should be at this current current state of technology. We should really be the ones that are you know passively listening for other signals or actively going out sending out sp spaceships to investigate. Um, through there and through there. So. Did, did I hear you correctly that you thought simple life, as no. in prokaryotes, were uncommon? Was, did I, you, my personal did you belief is that, ev that life, period, is uncommon. Yes. That, 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 ap that, that appears to be a, a minority position. Some of us, in particular, <laughs> um, when wa it was just Monday night that John Barrows was in town and presenting his arguments, and I'm referring to the uh, marine biologist from University of Washington, and even his pessimistic colleague, Peter Ward, of rare earth fame, uh, who, who is pessimistic about metazoans and eukaryotes, thinks, thinks that you snap your fingers and you get a prokaryote. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so my question is, why the pessimism about simple life, and and in particular, can you give us some estimates of Drake equation factors? Um, okay, so I, I do believe that the arguments regarding technological life that I you know, discussed in this past hour are reasonably strong I in implying or indicating that technological life is uncommon in our galaxy. Um, and as far as simple life, I don't think anybody knows. I think it's any one, one person's guess is as good as, as another person. And I don't claim to have any special expertise regarding, um, regarding the prevalence of simple life forms. I do believe, as I mentioned, that Kepler will, um, uh, no, sorry, not Kepler, TPF, Kepler will tell us a little bit, but mainly TPF or Darwin will, will, to a certain degree, answer how, um, how common uh, simple life might be. I mean, at least be a first steps in that direction. The, the main reason why I, th I believe that even simple life is very uncommon 
is because I think the origin of life is an incredibly difficult step in the whole in the sequence in the Drake equation sequence. I I think that. Um, um, well, why in this? Well, it's the origin of life, and the reason one reason why I think the origin of life is is not easy is one we we don't really have a good way to figure it out. But that's that's not you know right now it's not obvious. You know, once we have life, then it's sort of a little more obvious how you get to complex life and maybe even to intelligence. But um, so we don't really understand that step, and it does seem to be a fairly difficult one. But the other reason has to do with sort of a few observations we have that might be relevant. For example, we're all made out of the same handedness of molecules. I mean, all life on Earth, and this what this implies t to me at least is that the most likely explanation of that is that life originated only once in the entire history of life on earth because if it originated many times there ought to be the other hand in this there's a good chance the other hand in this of creatures would be here and they're not so if you have the earth which <coughs> has been you know there were hundreds of millions of years or whatnot that life had chance to originate multiple times and only managed to get going once in all that time then it must be quite a difficult thing to do. And then, you know, you need to, anyway, so that's just, but I, it's, I can't, I can't give. The right hand is wiped out the left hand. Well, why would you, I mean, you know, people, some people uh, eat uh, left-handed sugars, or right handed the wrong handedness of sugars because we don't metabolize that, um, and yet, you know, it still tastes sweet. So it's not clear that the right and the left would be fighting since we wouldn't necessarily be going after the same resources and whatnot. So. Um, you know, there are various other explanations that have been suggested as to why there's only one hand in this, but to me, the, the simplest and most direct way to explain that is life originated only once in the entire history of life on Earth. Hi. Yeah, it's a, obviously an endlessly fascinating topic. Um, regarding one of your assumptions uh, uh, that uh, we have not had any uh, extraterrestrial visits or reconnaissance and so on, uh, the phrase came to my mind that uh, uh, absence of evidence is not uh, evidence of, of absence, absence right. however it goes. Um, we may have just missed something that's staring us in the face and or the active and evolving and dynamic surface of the Earth, the lithosphere, may have wiped out some what had been in the past an obvious evidence of, and or it could be just something we're overlooking that you just mentioned, uh, handedness or chirality, I think it's called. There may well be some bacteria left behind by some visitors that, that, that left them behind, as we do uh, with everything we touch, um, that could be the opposite handedness and we just haven't come across it. Uh, it could be something, as, uh, it's kind of a dumb example, I'm not a biologist, but there could be many such things that, that with a little uh, imagination one might realize we might be overlooking altogether that may or may not be circumstantial evidence of, of such visits. Um, so um, the other uh, point I wanted to s give you to perhaps react upon uh, is it seemed like in your talk and the way you, you posed it is the, the next step up to send out a probe, a physical probe, was couched or your slides in terms of manned or occupied or, or, or the, the, the builders of it got on board and went with it as opposed to an unmanned probe, which to me seems like a big difference in cost effectiveness for something this extremely ambitious. Um, looking as you did at our recent history of exploring the solar system, um, one could claim that much of what we've learned about the solar system has been accomplished by unmanned robots rather than manned vehicles, such as we are now doing on Mars. And in the extreme case of going to a solar neighborhood star, it seems like a much more cost effective thing to use. It was um, uh, something by Ron Bracewell that uh, back in the, I think, the 50s or 60s, it was called the Bracewell Probe, I think now is what it's known as, where the someone such as you have described detected planets around the sun and sent such a probe here, and th this is something we should be looking for. So I was just curious about these two, about these two topics that you Okay, well, let me deal with the to address the second one first, then you may have to remind me what the first one was. But um, anyway, um, it <laughs> again, it's a question of whether somebody wants to watch something on TV, which is what a probe would be doing, or go there themselves. I, in addition to that quote from uh, Peter Hillary, here's one from Richard Branson, um, who was you know, the head of Virgin Airways and whatnot. 
I'd much rather be participating in an adventure than, than be in front of a TV watching someone else do it. And that's, that's basically why I just don't think that all that's going to happen is that r robots are going to be sent here. Um, unless we morph ourselves, and we ourselves morph into robots and we, you know, the kind of creatures we are just completely die out. But then it's not clear to me that um, those, those ultimate creatures are going to have any interest in doing SETI either, for that matter, if they're so different than, than we are now. Um, so, um, again, I, I just think it's because creatures are going to want to go and not just have these robotic t uh, eyes uh, beaming back information as, as per watching TV that... Um, that it's just not all going to be one done in, in the, in r by uh, robotic devices. It's, it's true that there are a lot, a lot of people on Earth who want to go to Mars. Uh, there's the Mars Society and whatnot. And, and the only reason we're not going there is it's too expensive. I mean, people aren't going there. So, you know, it's the, the, the non, uh, non people space program has been great. We've learned a lot. But that doesn't stop people from wanting to go and visit Mars themselves. But see, the other. The first point you made was um, well, more of a, a general. Uh, I think there was a second question about. But the, the logic is correct. If, if they have not visited Earth at all. Oh yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, I agree that there might be something here that we haven't found. But I. Th yeah, I, I think the burden of proof is frankly on somebody to find that something that they've left, whether it be here on Earth. Or out in out in, in, in you know somewhere in our solar system, there's just no evidence whatsoever for anything like that at this point, and um, I'm totally confident. Whereas I'm not totally confident that we won't find you know simple life forms somewhere else in our galaxy. I'm totally confident we're not going to find any evidence of the sort you're suggesting um, of visitations from from other from other civilizations, whether it be in some funny thing in biology on the Earth or in um, probes floating around in the asteroid belt. I mean, the, the burden of proof, I think, is, is for people who believe that this is, that, that we have been visited to, to, to find the evidence in that case. And I don't think you're going to be successful. Also, I think that if somebody, in many ways, if, if somebody comes, especially if they come in a kind of voyage where, where creatures rather than their robots come or their TV cameras come, that they're not, they're, you know, once you make this long, difficult voyage across interstellar space, you're just going to set up house here. And you're, you will have come long before we arose. So it's not like you have to hide yourselves from us or anything like that. You know, you'll be up space colonies orbiting around the sun. I mean, there are just so many ways they, they, the extraterrestrials could manifest themselves, and there's just no evidence for any of this. Um, Mine should be short because it's kind of an augmentation to, to his question. Um, I was also surprised that you didn't mention robotic <coughs> uh, travel and exploration, uh, mainly because I see the technology development to develop the autonomy that they would require to explore on their own is kind of a national byproduct or a natural byproduct of things that are happening already in other regards, just to to in the progress of civilization. Um, whereas the develop of, of vastly Advanced uh, propulsion systems that could carry a civilization, uh, you know, a, s a small colony with it, essentially, might be a little more of a of a of, of a of a diversion from the normal course of things on Earth or in the solar system here. Um, so maybe there's not a question because I think you've already probably answered it. Yeah, none of us really know what a civilization that's been around for hundreds of thousands or millions of years is going to look like or be wanting to. So I mean, that's you know ultimately what it comes down to. Um, Yes. Um, it seems to me there's kind of two aspects to this whole thing. One is, is there intelligent life somewhere out there in our galaxy or in the universe? And the other is, will we be able to make contact with them or will they make contact with us? And your talk, it seemed to me, was really about that second part Yes, that's uh, right. more than that first part. And I, I actually find the first part kind of interesting, and we got into it in our discussion here. And that, it, my question sort of is, um, you know, if we find other planets that have similar characteristics as Earth has, similar atmosphere, similar distance from their sun, that kind of thing. Then the question becomes, you know, what is it that takes life to, ha life to happen? That's what we've been discussing about. And I don't know how easy or hard that is, and we don't know. But it does seem to me once life happens, um, I, I guess I 
believe pretty strongly that simple life with the, with the kind of chemical composition we have on Earth and the, and the environment we have here, that you know, the, the progression of life is, is almost a given to some sort of uh, some, something becoming what we think of as intelligent now. I guess we could argue well, about that. But that didn't happen on Mars. They suppose that but, simple but that, life had, but, had, had but, come but, but up on Mars. Mars doesn't have the same co chemical composition as Earth. Okay, no, so, there, so there might be too. environments where l simple life can happen, okay? And, and we may not know the answer to these questions, but it seems to me that we have a much better chance of determining, not maybe contacting other life, but coming up with pretty strong conclusions about whether or not life exists on other planets if a combination of understanding how life came to happen on this planet and what the conditions are for it and um, probing other... Uh, uh, galaxies and uh, uh, other systems uh, to see whether or not there are planets that are Earth-like, and I mean Earth-like in a fairly strong sense. Comments? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure I have anything to add to what, I mean, you, you made a sort of a, a comment and, you know, it's... Uh, well, we've uh, certainly gone over the topic very well, so if uh, you'll join me in thanking Ben for his